Okay, well, without uh, further ado, uh, I will introduce Judge Cynthia Wheelis, who will lead us the rest of this morning. She is the presiding judge of the 417th District Court in Collin County. She hears both juvenile and child protection cases and is board certified in juvenile law. Judge Wheelis has been instrumental in many children's commission efforts, such as the Dual Status Task Force and the Beyond the Bench Law, Justice, and Communities Summit. Judge Wheelis currently serves as a commissioner on the Judicial Commission for Mental Health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. And good morning, everyone. This year, we have the privilege of devoting our entire morning to the intersection of mental health and juvenile justice. This is done in connection with our first release of the first edition of the Juvenile Mental Health Bench Book, which we are very, very excited about. Just as the Judicial Commission on Mental Health Bench Book is an invaluable resource to judges and stakeholders across this great state of Texas, we hope that the juvenile version will be just as valuable a resource for your ever hopefully growing toolbox. A very genuine and special thank you to all the individuals who put so much time, effort, and their expertise into making this bench book what it is. A digital version, as you've heard, is available on the JCMH website and a limited number of hard copies for those of us who like to have the paper in our hand will be available for distribution from JCMH. I want to personally thank Christy Taylor and her team, Molly Davis and Kama Harris, for their tireless devotion to Texans mental health and all justice systems, and for paying particular special attention to my um, heart of hearts, juvenile justice. I would also be remiss if I did not thank for their leadership, Chief Justice Hecht and Presiding Judge Keller, Justice Bland, Judge Hervey, Justice Boyce, for setting the mental health of Texans as a priority in all of our courts across, across this great state. Kicking us off this morning is Dr. Andy Keller. He'll be discussing and presenting on new psychiatric resources for Texas children and youth. Dr. Keller will be delivering the presentation by himself as Luann Southern was not able to be with us today. Dr. Andy Keller is president, chief executive officer, and Linda Perryman Evans, presidential chair of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, a Texas-based nonprofit that provides nonpartisan policy and program research, development, and advice to state and local le leaders towards a single goal, improving mental health care delivery in Texas. Andy, Dr. Keller, is a licensed psychologist with more than 20 years of experience in behavioral health policy, financing, and best practices, and he is the perfect person to lead us off this morning with that intersection for children and youth. Thank you, Dr. Keller, and welcome. Well, thank you, and it's great to be here today. I'm really sorry I'm not able to be here with my good friend, Luann Southern, who uh, knows more about uh, the intersection of mental health for youth than uh, any other person in Texas. And uh, she's a great resource. And the wonderful thing is she's the executive director of one of the, of the main organization I'm gonna be talking about today. So Luann is an ongoing resource and she's here in spirit and uh, uh, I'll try to not disappoint her. So it's great to be here today. Um, you're actually, I hope you all are sending pictures in because you're gonna see some pictures of me here in a second. Uh, so like if I'm willing to put my baby picture up, y'all should be willing to like put in your fancy glamour shots that y'all use in your whatever publication you're in, because I know you're all very distinguished people, which is why I wore a tie today, which I'm very excited about because you don't get to do that all the time on Zoom. So I'm going to talk about um, the progression of mental illness because I want to give you a little background on that. And there's going to be about 10 minutes, hopefully, at the end for questions, hopefully most of which are about the new resources I'm going to talk about. But we can also talk about mental health conditions, developmental disabilities, because, you know, there's a lot of knowledge there that you as judges and court officials uh, and other folks involved in the system need to know about, because it's a pretty complicated set of illnesses, and there's many, many systems that serve them. But I'm going to try to hit a couple of big points. So one big point that's not on the slide you're seeing is that before somebody gets to your court, um, whether it's a juvenile court, a family court, a adult court, and they have a mental illness, chances are, uh, on average, the data show on average that they have had that mental illness for eight to 10 years. And if you think about how other illnesses are, if you wait eight to 10 years, things not to work, tend not to work out so well. 
So one of the exciting things, and this is exciting not just for folks in family courts and juvenile courts, but also folks uh, with courts seeing adults, is that the things that have started up since the 86 legislature over the last uh, nine months uh, are really here not just to address the needs of youth and children and families, but also to begin to get ahead of the curve so we don't have as many people showing up in your courts later with untreated psychiatric disorders, untreated psychosis. Um, and the key to that is that half of all mental illnesses begin by the age of 14. And when they begin, they're not that severe. It's not like, uh, you know, at eight years old, the child um, immediately develops a psychosis or that someone's depression immediately puts them into a place where they feel suicidal. The, just like any other illness, like, you know, my grandpa, he was discovered in terms of his uh, heart disease in the mid 70s when he had a heart attack. And they put him on egg beaters and a low cholesterol diet when they brought him out of his coma and brought him home. Me, they've been haranguing in my primary care clinic about my potential heart disease since I was in my 30s. So that shift of early intervention is the critical shift for any set of illnesses. And we're so fortunate in Texas that we now have an infrastructure where we can begin to do that. 75% um, of these illnesses are in place by the time we reach young adulthood. And you're going to hear later about the adolescent brain today. And that adolescent brain and I, I'm sorry for those of you who you know have 13-year-olds or 14-year-olds at home, it doesn't actually finish resolving until about your mid-20s. So our brains aren't done developing until the mid-20s. So that adolescence does go longer, just like you thought it might have. Um, and so that a lot of the rest of the mental illnesses begin by then. So I want to talk and use myself and my own mental illness, which is an anxiety disorder, which is the most prevalent mental illness. My guess is many of you also suffer from some of these. Uh, I got first inspired to start talking more about my anxiety and my disorder when I saw Emma Stone talk about it. If Emma Stone can talk about her anxiety disorder, I can talk about mine. My pictures will not be quite as fancy as hers, but, um, but I want to go all the way back to little Andy Keller, um, age four. I'm not quite four here. This is me and my baptism with my parents. Uh, when I was in my baby book, there's only a few quotes that my parents put in there, but one of them was, Mom, I'm so anxious. And I think this was before uh, Christmas. So my mom, I think, put it in there because she thought it was cool that I used the word anxious as a three-year-old. Um, but I think she also knew that, like, this was an energetic kid who had lots of worries. She called me the, her wuff boy. Mom, what if a horror tornado comes? What if the house burns down? What if uh, grandpa doesn't come home? I mean, like, I was the wuff kid. And so all this anxiety and uh, this happening. And here's the thing. Most mental illnesses look like anxiety early on. Um, they, they look at worries. They look like concerns. And, and that's, that's something to keep in mind, that we don't necessarily know what that mental illness is going to be. And that's why it would have been so awesome if my mom could have gone to a pediatrician and said, uh, my wolf boy here, what's kind of going on with him? Like, is this normal? He's different than my other. You know, at that point, I was her only kid, so she didn't have anybody to compare it to. Uh, my mom actually did a tremendous job researching herself. Like you can see all the, the books on the shelf about dealing with sort of the difficult child. My favorite one was Breaking the Strong-Willed Child, which I don't know if that one worked well or not, but she certainly did her best. And my mom, uh, you know, you know, kind of self-educated. But a lot of moms, a lot of families aren't in a position to do that. Uh, they don't have the resources or it doesn't occur to them to do that. Uh, and so we need people to help us. So it would have been great if my mom could have had somebody during that time to, to answer her questions. Of course, now when I got to this stage, this good looking guy, and this is how we dressed in the 80s, for those of you who didn't live through this. So this is my point. You shouldn't be afraid to send your pictures in. So this is right before prom. I have not received any treatment at this point in my life for my anxiety disorder. It's kind of pretty strong at this point. It's a kind of a miracle I got to prom. Uh, and, you know, at this point, it, it, and I mean, like, I would have a hard time speaking at different places. I was doing public speaking and working my way through that. But it was really kind of getting bad. But this is also the point where if it was going to get worse and be more than an anxiety disorder, it would have. Because between the ages of 15 and about 30 is when our more severe mental illnesses begin to manifest. Now, depression can be very severe, and that begins manifesting earlier. But I'm talking about psychosis, things like schizophrenia, uh, schizoaffective disorder. These are disorders where we lose track of reality. We have hallucinations. And this is the age where we would start seeing that. So, you know, a little anxious Andy Keller, if I had happened to have a slightly different brain wiring where I would be tending more towards a psychosis, this is when you would have begun to see that. And one of the big issues is that's so hard about psychosis is that when it hits, it freezes your development. So those of you who remember back when you were 18, or if you have children in their teens right now, imagine if they didn't learn any life skills after the age of 18. Like if I had my development frozen here, in addition to not necessarily being a snazzy dresser, I would have also not known how to cook anything other than peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, because that's all I knew how to cook at this point in my life. I had no idea how to do laundry because I had the mom that did my laundry. 
um, and we've had to be able to do that. Uh, I, you know, I would have been frozen there. And that's one of the really difficult things when you see a homeless individual at age like 28 who's had in the throes of a psychosis. Chances are that psychosis hit sometime before they really figured out how to hold down a job, how to balance a checkbook, how to do all those adult things we need to learn. And here's the really tragic thing is this good looking guy here, age 49, which is, this is one of my younger pictures. Uh, I don't, it's been a few years since I took this picture. Uh, this is the age that if I had a psychosis or other severe mental illness uh, that manifests more than uh, like that, that I would have died. Because age 49 and a half is the average age of death for people with severe mental illnesses in Texas. And then we don't die from suicide if we die then. We tend to die from other comorbid health conditions that don't get treated because we never got the care we needed. And so it's things like heart disease, metabolic disorders, um, and other conditions that take our lives prematurely in Texas if we have mental illnesses. And, you know, this is getting worse, y'all. I mean, I think we know that with COVID, um, uh, disorders are on the rise. There was a big study done by the CDC this summer that found that anxiety disorders like mine are up threefold. 300% compared to a year ago. And these aren't just like, you know, are you worried? Like these are things where it gets in the way of people leaving their home. And I mean, it makes sense in a pandemic, more people are going to be worried about leaving home. But look at the depression up fourfold from a year before. And this isn't, again, just feeling blue. This is debilitating depression that gets in the way of your daily activities. We have more people starting substance use, um, severe substance use. We have twice as many people, and that includes youth, Um, reporting serious consideration of suicide than a year ago. And we have run projections at the Institute, um, and we've been uh, projecting them really since April that shows we're probably going to have, if we have sustained unemployment at the levels we do and the other economic things, which also hurt this, um, both increased deaths from uh, overdose because of increased use of drugs and alcohol and, and greater use, and also increased deaths from depression. So we know that this is happening. We've got a lot of attention to this throughout the media. But the critical thing is we have to get our health systems able to detect and treat this. Just like we had to do with COVID, we've had to, you know, institute testing. How long is that taking to be able to detect all cases of COVID? Well, here's the thing. We're going to get all cases of COVID um, built into detection in our health system well before we have for mental illness. And we know how to detect mental illness. The tests we've had for decades around mental illness, uh, which is just a couple of questions, which are highly reliable, um, over 80 to 90 percent reliable for being able to detect mental illness. We don't have out there in the field. And so what happened this year, um, and that's how it works. Like, so the, if you look in this diagram, you know, most of us go to primary care um, to get most of our health care. And that's where my heart disease was detected. Um, I don't have heart disease yet. I have kind of the pre Cursors of that that we're trying to uh, treat through uh, diet. And at some point, I might start taking a statin. I haven't started that yet, but I'm in a good argument with my doctor about that. Um, we need to do that with other illnesses and kind of have a more organized system because that's not the system we have right now for mental illness. For mental illness right now, the system tends to begin with that crisis, which puts the person in front of law enforcement and in front of your courts. What we have now, though, is this really cool thing called the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium. And what that does is, you see that little cool little green triangle? Well, I don't know what that is. I guess it's a five-sided, I don't know what that is. I didn't really do that well in geometry, but it's an interesting little box uh, between primary care and the rest of the system that's there to put some critical supports into our pediatric system to begin to detect mental illness earlier. So this is where I would have transitioned to Luann, who would have talked and much more knowledgeable than I can about the Child Mental Health Care Consortium. I have been involved, though, uh, since the plot was hatched to get this through the 86th legislature. Um, the institutes worked really closely with Dr. Lakey, um, with all of the medical schools to put this in place. And so Luann is the executive director and is someone you should definitely get to know and reach out to with more questions. But what the consortium does is it has two programs that are there to help address the needs of children and families and adolescents earlier than otherwise. And it also has programs to increase our capacity in our workforce, which is also a big gap, not just in Texas, but nationally. So the cool thing about um, the consortium is it's a consortium of our 12 state-funded medical schools. So the, every region of Texas has a medical school anchoring the system. And the core support that's within this is the Child Psychiatry Access Network. Um, the Child Psychiatry Access Network is a program that's actually been rolled out in 30 states. We were about the 30th. We're the state, though, that's invested the most in it, and we're ramping up to make it available to every pediatrician, family practice doc, um, clinic that's serving children and families across Texas. Thousands of practices are enrolled as of today. We will have over 10,000 practices enrolled by the end of the first two years, and hopefully we can accelerate and get to them quicker because of all the stresses on people. 
But what these child psychiatry aspects networks are about is helping the pediatrician or the family practice doctor, the nurse practitioner, who's your family uh, doctor, uh, know what to do when uh, a Mrs. Keller brings in her little Andy Keller, who's a West kid, and says, what's going on with him? And to be able to help um, uh, that parent know how to be a parent, a better, a more effective parent in terms of treating the health needs of a child with a mental illness, which, by the way, most of the time does not result in medication. The reason we have so much medication used is we don't intervene early enough. And we also have uh, child doctors who don't know what to do. And so they go to the medications they think are going to be able to give the most help. Um, and when we look at states like Massachusetts and Washington State that have had these access networks in place um, longer, um, which it's it's pretty simple. What it means is within um, 30 minutes and usually within 15 minutes, a primary care dog can get a real-time doc-to-doc discussion with a child psychiatrist or a behavioral health specialist, depending on who they need, um, to be able to determine what what to tell a family to help a child. So that we're basically retraining and helping transition our entire pediatric uh, workforce in Texas through this intervention. And what that does and what these other states have shown is we actually use fewer medications. And more importantly, we misuse medications less. Um, some of the things that we've seen in our child welfare population and foster care, overuse of antipsychotics in cases where really the child doesn't need them, that's the kind of uh, medication uh, or uh, bad prescription, bad prescribing that this can help change. So it's really exciting. It's also something that you can know as a judge that in your community is increasingly knowing that there are pediatricians out there who can treat most of the mental illnesses that the children and families in your court um, suffer from, because most mental illnesses are moderate to mild. They're not severe, um, and they really do not require a psychiatrist. They don't require a mental health specialist um, to have a, that. Most mental health care actually happens in primary care. The other cool thing is they have a referral system here to help those children and families who need more to get linked to it. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, and it'll be an important resource to know and your medical school in your region um, is the one who's going to be a resource to you and, and can certainly answer questions and help you know what's happening there. The other cool program is what's called TCHAT, the Child, Texas Child Access Through Telemedicine Program, which basically puts into any Texas school that wants it, and we have hundreds of schools signed up already, a real-time consultation if they're worried about the mental health of a child. Now, this is not universal access to mental health care. I wish we had that. We don't. Um, really, no place has that yet. We're working on it. Um, but what this does is it gives, should, once fully scaled, give universal access to any school with an urgent psychiatric evaluation for any child they're worried about. So if little Andy Keller would have started drawing pictures of dead people or bombs or blood and a showed it to a teacher and, and he was concerned about me, he could use the T-Chat program to reach out and get me a real-time uh, consul- a real-time assessment. Now, he t- would need my parents' permission because these are mental, these are health services. Just like any health service in Texas, the, the legal caregiver, um, if the ch- child is not at an age where they can make those decisions themselves, needs to be involved. And that's good. We want parents involved, not just for, for the legal reasons, but also though they're the most important people in a child's life. I mean, you know, whether you think they're doing a great job or not, that's who that child has. And that's who we need to get onto their side um, or to help get the supports through the foster care system to get someone else in there who can help with it in a better way. But the TCHAP program is a tremendous resource, and you should really try to understand the big school districts as well as the smaller school districts in your part of the state where their TCHAP linkages are. Not every school needs that. School, many schools already have really effective partnerships with their local mental health authorities through grants, through uh, programs they've developed themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the TCHAP program is to basically create that playing field where any child, regardless of insurance, regardless of documentation, there's no paperwork requirement. They just can. They just have these linkages, and they get up to four sessions to help transition them into other care and to assess what's going on. Last couple things I'll talk about, and then I'm hoping that we have some questions, and I'm looking over here in the chat function because I hope you have questions about this, um, are some of the workforce expansions. The neat thing about these schools is this is where most of our child psychiatrists are and where most of them are trained. So we have, we're actually in the process of doubling our uh, child, uh, oh, actually, this is about the community workforce expansion. I, I switched my slides. I'm sorry. These were Luann's slides. I apologize. So this is the one about public sector. So a lot of our psychiatrists these days, there's a real temptation to go out and uh, practice uh, in the cash market where you just, you know, $300 an hour and you just see whoever has enough money to come see you. And, I, you know, that's fine. Uh, people have their student loans to pay back. People want to provide for their families. There's nothing wrong with that. But we want to expose our young psychiatrists to the option of public sector service. 
So the cool thing about the community psychiatry workforce expansion is we funded now residency programs in local mental health authorities and other public sector settings to expose these young doctors, hundreds of them every year, to the potential of working in the public sector and being able to expand access for Texans who uh, otherwise couldn't afford care. It's very exciting, and we have a lot of additional folks. Um, and those 12 academic faculty who are going to be part of our local mental health authorities are leveraging then their entire networks of residents. So that's really cool. Um, the other program that I started to talk about was the expansion of our child psychiatry access fellowships. We have 19 new fellowship positions available. We have four new training programs starting up. By the time this is fully in place, we will have doubled the number of child psychiatrists that we're putting out every year in Texas, helping build our workforce. And, you know, and it, it, there, there's only a couple hundred out there already. So, I mean, by being able to put out 40 a year instead of 20 a year, um, and most do stay in Texas when they do their fellowships here. It's going to be a tremendous expansion to our workforce and help position us better for those young people who do need that specialty. So I'm going to put up here while I take questions, just sort of the, the website for the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium. You can Google it. You can read more about these programs. You can kind of figure out in your county who the CPAN or TCHAT providers are. Um, you can also encourage the schools that you work with to be able to get more engaged. And I'm going to start looking now at some of the questions. So first question I have is what are some examples of non-medical and non-psychiatric types of treatments, uh, particularly when we're helping uh, folks in the juvenile system, young, adult, uh, young people there? What are things other than medical? And I think by medical, I'm, I'm thinking you mean non-medication. So medication, I, first of all, I want to put in a plug for medication. Medication can be helpful. Um, and, you know, somebody who struggled with that for family members who I've cared about, uh, you know, can you progress without medication? A lot of times you can, but a lot of times, you know, if you, especially if you're struggling with suicide, debilitating anxiety, uh, medications can help take that edge off and help you progress in the treatment. And really, that's the best treatment is a mix of the two. So um, we really want both. A lot of times, though, youth in the juvenile justice system, they're really not suffering from bipolar disorder or um, psychotic disorders. They tend to be more trauma-based disorders, depression, anxiety, things that maybe need medication but maybe don't. The most effective treatment for juvenile uh, folks in the juvenile justice system is multisystemic therapy. A multisystemic therapy focuses on the adults and systems in that young person's life to help them create more controls, more supervision, but really more engagement as loving adults to help that young person Get back on a track of healthy development, good choices, and stay on that track. So uh, multisystemic therapy, which we have programs in uh, Houston, uh, in El Paso, but we really need a lot more across the state. And that's one of the initiatives that the Judicial Commission is looking at with the legislature next year is probably the best one we could do. Um, but also we have, uh, you know, basically anything that helps a youth get with, uh, get the adults in their life better organized to be there for them. I mean, it, it kind of sounds straightforward, but that's because it is. So those are the supports that are most helpful. Um, and so we could certainly talk more about that. I would encourage you too to link with your CPAN hub in your region because they can talk to you about the specific programs in your region um, and be a resource to your court as well through their networks. Second question is, do children end up on a statewide database? No, they do not. There is no statewide database. There is no uh, uh, there's really strong firewalls put in place on this. The consultations that happen between the primary care doctor and the uh, the, um, the CPAN networks are they're not medical treatments. So there's not a electronic health record created for the child on the consultation. Their care is done by the primary care doc. It's a doc to doc consultation. So there's no uh, record generated. Uh, there is tracking of you know the child and some of their information that's done by that specific CPAM provider, but there's not a statewide database uh, that is used for any purpose other than to follow up with that individual. And it's not a medical database. It just references whether or not there was a consultation that happened. So it's a really important thing. And it's something that, uh, it's important to protect. I would say, though, that um, if you're super concerned, though, about a statewide database of children and others with psychiatric diagnoses, you should ask yourself, are you also concerned about that for cancer? Because we do have statewide databases of cancer and patients. And we do, I mean, they're voluntary. You don't have to get into them. But, you know, voluntary databases where people have informed consent and decide that they actually want to have themselves tracked so they can have follow-up and whatnot, um, I would argue is a pretty good thing as long as there's protections in place for that individual. And it's the same protections we have for every other disorder. So while I appreciate people's concern, I would ask you to try not to have a higher standard for the illnesses that happen in your brain um, than you do for other. And it's really, to me, not a higher standard. It's actually a more 
rigid standard and one that really doesn't fit the data. So we've put a lot of protections in place around healthcare data, but those protections are in place for all healthcare data. So, and it's individual choice, but I, I would ask people to kind of try to be even handed there and not have a stigmatized view of data about mental disorders different from other disorders. Um, another question is how should parents address their doctors who may or may not know about the CPAN? I would just ask your doctor and say, hey, I, uh, this is what's going on and, and go in and say, I have concerns. And if the doctor uh, seems like they don't know what's going on, say, hey, are, do you, are you using the consultation network that's available? So you probably want to empower the parent by knowing who the medical school is uh, in your region. And you can see that on the website, who the medical schools are, what the medical schools are. You can get information from calling those numbers and say, hey, I'm a judge. I want to make sure I've got these numbers. You can have the court do it. They're happy to share that information with you. And we basically need parents to ask, um, just like we do for everything else. You know, you see those commercials. You probably, Well, some of you probably see the commercials. I see more the older I get because I think they're targeting me to ask about certain medications. Ask your doctor. If they're using the CPAN, that's what we need to encourage people to do. Uh, there's another question about how we help children and adolescents whose parents are not on board for receiving mental health. Well, it's a good question. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the schools have a range of supports they can do. The teach app programs, even if the parent doesn't want to participate in that, it still begins a dialogue between the school and that parent about what's going on and allows the, the school and the other official to begin to ask those questions. I also think, too, the more that we get pediatricians trained in this, pediatricians are going to be some of our best advocates because they're going to ask questions. And who do you tend to develop that trust and relationship with? I mean, not everybody has a pediatrician or a family doctor. But most people do develop those relationships, whether it's with a clinic or someone else. Um, and so we really think the pediatrician's proactively asking and empowering parents and helping combat some of the myths that we're not going to put your child on medication. We're going to help you be as good a parent as you can be. Um, we'll talk about medication if your child's suicidal and maybe going to die from suicide because you probably want us to. Um, but, you know, we're not going to just give you meds, just like we don't give meds when we start looking at cancer risks. I mean, we do that if you actually have cancer. And most people who have cancer like the fact that they're getting chemotherapy, but not everybody. People can make their own choices. Um, so it's really that education that happens through the family doctor. I think that's the best. And then I think we have to look at our other community leaders, um, faith-based communities, other institutions that can really kind of be supports because, you know, they're important supports for cancer treatment. I mean, my mom got as much care from people making her casseroles at her church as she did and reaching out through CareBridge as she did uh, through her oncologist, I would argue. I'm going to do a couple more questions real quick. Really appreciate these. These are spot on questions. Um, oh, by the way, some parents might need you to help them. That's why some parents end up in your court because they're not providing medical care. And that doesn't just happen for psychiatric illnesses. It happens for other illnesses. And it often is good reasons because you know what? We don't want as parents to think of our children as sick. No one wants to see their child ill. Childhood illnesses are tragic and difficult. And I would argue that's one of the things that makes the stigma on mental health so strong is because it's a pediatric illness. And the last thing we want to think of our child as is ill. Um, and we do not want to think of their brains not being there for them. You know, as somebody whose brain was not there for me <laughs> in the way that my friends were, it can work out. Like, I'm feeling like my life's okay. Like, I don't feel like I'm very messed up. You know, people, I'm married. People like me, some, not everybody. But, uh, you know, you can do things despite having a mental illness. And that's, I think, the message that we need to have for any illness. Um, you know, we just lost uh, Alex Trebek, right? You know, um, over the weekend uh, from Jeopardy, he died of pancreatic cancer. And, you know, most people get pancreatic cancer, die. It doesn't, it's not a very good diagnosis to get, but you know, we don't relegate them to, you know, be on their own and be alone just because they've got an illness that it's hard to recover from. And some mental illnesses are hard to recover from, but most are not. And that includes most cases of psychosis. Most people with psychosis get better. And that's what the evidence shows. So I'm going to do one more question, maybe two, if I can talk fast enough. I'm sorry, I do talk fast. Um, Okay, so this person has two child case workers has to cover four counties, and that is a huge problem that needs to be addressed. So rural communities. So I'm really glad you asked about that. So first of all, rural courts, you know, I am not an expert in that, um, but I am in favor of you having more resources. So you can talk to David Slayton about that tomorrow, about the resources that come to your courts. Um, but I, as a psychologist, I want you to have as many as you can have. But I'll tell you right now that access to healthcare in rural parts of Texas has never been better than it is today. And there's one word that explains that, my friends, and that is telehealth. Telehealth um, regulations have been rolled back, and not only for folks who have broadband, but audio only. Audio only telehealth is now legal and paid for through Medicare and through every other type of insurance. 
And we are going to work super hard in the 87th legislature to make sure it stays legal. Why? Because it works. It works really well. It were, and tell it only. Those of you who've been on a lot of Zoom calls, you know how much you wish you didn't have to be on Zoom, right? You love now the audio only phone call because you don't have to like put on your tie. You can leave your slippers on. You don't have to go get that dress shirt that's hanging there. You can wear your sweater. Um, and so that works. If audio only works for meetings, it works for most psychiatric care. Not all. I mean, not 100%, but a lot. And if we can shift to telehealth and maintain those telehealth gains, then we save our face-to-face visits for the people who truly need those, which is not the majority of folks. So help us with that and advocate for that. Um, Wish I could take more questions. Um, Can't, because we got to get you on time to your next uh, sessions, but it's really an honor to be here. And uh, both Luann and I, you can reach us through our websites. We're happy to answer more questions. You'll have a lot of other experts here throughout the conference that can answer the questions I didn't get to. So I'm going to hand this back to you, Judge Wallace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Keller, uh, for your both your personal and professional experience and your commitment and contribution to mental health for the for the state of Texas and um, from children to adults. 